Hello, this is Brian Parham with The Rock Dojo. I'm here to talk about why is music important with one of my favorite music educators and guitarist, Angus Clark. I can't even begin to tell you how excited I am to sit down and meet with you today. So thank you so very, very much for doing this. Brian, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me and hello to everyone. <laughs> and I believe you were going to play something for us. Yeah, I can. I, I'm, I can have a bit of a jam here over a over a backing track. I can do a little something. Shall we? Shall we do that? Okay, cool. All right, here we go. Uh... about i became first familiar with angus's work through true fire he has some incredible guitar courses on true fire uh, including neoclassical essential guitar he has a british metal invasion he has a hard rock lead and rhythm survival and now i believe it's called pentatonic power which i was drooling over did i get that right you look like it, it, there are two courses that came out uh in very quick succession one is pentatonic alchemy okay the art of making gold out of the five notes of the pentatonic scale and and then we have beyond pentatonics where i take the approach of um you start with the pentatonic scale and your licks in the pentatonic scale which a lot of us start with and then we just add a couple of notes in order to get the the flavors the diatonic flavor like the you know what the sound of the modes, couple of couple of the modes that are popular in rock and just major and minor. So it just goes beyond pentatonic, but the foundation is in the pentatonic. So it's kind of like taking these little steps towards broadening the number of notes that you use to solo, right? Because you start with five, then you add the blue note, you're up to six. <laughs> then, you, you know, you can add the you know two notes of the diatonic scale. Now you have seven notes to pick from when you solo. So that was the now, principle. After watching you play, I know what I, what I need to study next. <laughs> I'm going to be clearing out my calendar now, you know, evenings that is for that pentatonic course. So anyway, Ben, thank you so much. As I'm mostly familiar with you through your work as a music education, do you mind to give us a little bit of background about who you are and your work in music? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so my, um, I'm from originally from New York City, and I started taking guitar. Uh, so I'm I'm 53, just so everyone's aware. So when I was 12 and 13, um, the Wall came out, and by Pink Floyd, which is not only an amazing album, uh, it's also an amazing album of guitar solos. And so David Gilmour is is a huge foundation for me. Um, also, I was a huge fan of uh, Black Sabbath. At the time I started engaging with music, um, there was a Ronnie James Dio version of, of Black Sabbath 
So I got to see the Mob Rules tour. Um, but I bought the whole back catalog and Ozzy came out. So Randy Rhodes was huge for me, Tony Iommi, David Gilmore. And I lived through Ingve, you know, kind of destroying all your notions of what guitar could be. And, uh, and that was, that's where my burn in was, was kind of done. It was like Shanker, Ingve, uh, Richie Blackmore, Randy Rhodes, Tony Naomi. So everybody that came after that, that are highly revered guitar players are amazing guitar players, but, but it, my burn in stops in like 82. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but so from there, uh, oh, and John Sykes, right? Okay. So, but for, for, from there, I, I went to college at USC in Los Angeles, where I was, that was right when Racer X were playing. Like I used to go see Racer X, play at the country club. And like, you know, I hung out at GIT when Paul Gilbert was teaching there and that kind of stuff. When I, when I, and one summer in college, I worked at a recording studio in New York where I worked with hung out with and worked with Bruce Springsteen, Whitney Houston, Brian Adams, John Waite, Billy Idol, like all those people came into this one studio I worked at that summer. So that was my first entree into like the professional music industry. It was my summer between my sophomore and junior years in college working at this recording studio in New York. And so I got to you know see how all this stuff is done. I finished my music degree at USC and then came back to New York and the joined a band that got dropped. So I was totally set on being a band guy. Just totally wanted to be an artist, part of a collective band unit. Um, and we got signed and we got dropped. And after after we got dropped, I you know had had once you've been signed to a label, you start to meet people. And suddenly it was '94. Grunge took over. All the rock guys with the chops were either becoming songwriters or not working. And I got hired by a new age artist named Kitaro, who was specifically looking for someone who could look and play like David Gilmour. And I was like, David Gilmour is the reason I play the guitar. You're going to pay me for that? That's awesome. I can't believe it. And so that began my career as more of a sideman. And I toured with Kitaro for on and off for about four or five years. In between, I did a couple of projects with uh, baby bands, you know, newly signed bands that were just getting their, you know, needed an additional guitar player. One of which featured uh, featured a singer who's now in KMFDM, and also featured JD John DeServio, who's also in Black Label Society. So, like, you know, you start to get this evolving pool of uh, contacts. I also started teaching and I was teaching at a place called National Guitar Workshop and at National Guitar Workshop was a summer program and we had lots of guest artists come and one of the guest artists that came was Marty Friedman and so he and I met each other and he he actually was a huge fan of Kitaro. He had worked with Kitaro and so we, we started communicating and uh, in 2001, the Trans-Siberian Orchestra needed another guitar player. And they had actually called Marty about the gig. And he gave them my number. He said, oh, I know a guy who lives in New York. And, um, and then I got the Trans-Siberian Orchestra gig in 2001. And uh, have had it ever since. So we're going on 20 years. It's, it's 21 years now, but it's, it would have been 20 years last year if we had toured. And, uh, and then uh, beyond that, I've played with Joe Lynn Turner, who was in Rainbow and Deep Purple. I've played, I've, last couple of years, I've been playing shows with Cher, four decades of hits, and, uh, and um, numerous other, I, I've written songs with members of Jethro Tull. They've performed a, co a couple of my songs, and uh, I just am keeping busy. So, uh, and I've had a band called Daredevil Squadron. We kind of have a progressive metal. Meet. It's somewhere between new wave of traditional heavy metal and progressive metal. Um, and, uh, and a couple of solo albums, one as a singer-songwriter. So I just, just love music and I love doing it and uh, try to keep my hand in it. That's the main thing. <laughs> 
Amazing, amazing. I gotta ask you because your guitar sounded so good. And you were about to tell me before we went on. What, what, tell, can you tell me a little bit about the guitar that you're holding? Uh, yeah, the, uh, so this, this is a um, 1992 Fender Floyd Rose Classic. And um, the Flo I, I played a Fender Floyd Rose Classic all, the whole time I was in the Kitaro band. And this was kind of like Fender's first, Fender, all through the late 80s, everybody in LA had taken a Fender and modified it with a Floyd Rose, a humbucker, uh, and a, a Floyd Rose and a humbucker, or they were getting a made by James Tyler and these other guys. Fender finally got a deal with Floyd Rose, put a humbucker in the Strat and put these out in like 91, right when suddenly nobody wanted that guitar anymore. They're like, right? So I had one, the Rosewood fingerboard one that I played in the, all the guitar dates. So it's really near and dear to my heart. And a former student of mine, who's now very successful running a music program for a um, kind of a, a, one of these big um, worship outfits, uh, actually found this one and said, oh, Angus was saying he wanted a maple one and he gifted it to me. So I, I, I thank Eric Struthers every day for sending me this guitar. And then uh, I've had uh, my guy, Anthony Marcatelli, do a bunch of work on it, kind of, this is a Duncan uh, pickup here. And I'm just playing it through my, at one of the TSO Axe Effects patches. <laughs> incredible and it's a very beautiful looking guitar so i want to go back to when you were first getting started as i primarily deal with guitar lessons for kids what was the first song or riff you learned on the guitar oh first song or riff i learned on the guitar um the uh one of the, i always i i think of it as this is the one that stuck with me is tomorrow's dream uh from black sabbath volume four and it, and I don't even know what the tuning is. I learned it. I learned it in standard tuning. So it's like it's in the key of D. And it's like. <laughs> But the solo was what was so important to me, and that was kind of like this. There's a there's a lot in there that's still baked into my playing. Like I'm I'm always playing the pentatonic from a sliding kind of that those inflections. Like that's still just like that. That's just part of it. But then you know I would have also played. I might have learned Iron Man first. Let's be honest, right? <laughs> Guitar sounds like a fire breathing dragon. You sound <laughs> so good, dude. Okay, so how did you develop your voice as a guitar player? Well, um, I think so. I think that you have to focus on fundamentals at first. It's like the number one thing that you're looking to your teacher for. Uh, I, my teachers early on were not uh, overly focused on teaching me songs it was it was all about uh fundamentals like do you are you holding the pick correctly let's play this exercise and we you know it was like etudes it would be written on sheet music so i was learning to read while i was learning to play the guitar and and it was all just about being able to play in time in tune hand synchronization all those things. So you start with the fundamentals, right? And fundamentals, we could loosely describe that as like chops. You start with this basic recognizing pitches, playing in time, chords, getting all this kind of, you know, just a basic power chord or a basic bar chord. I remember the first time I played one, the teacher was like, okay, okay, you got it. All right, now squeeze the heck out of it and let's see what we get. And it was like, and, and then he was like, that's good. It's good. 
let's try it again, you know, and then eventually you get it, you get it happening. Um, so then the voice develops based on like what I'm listening to. And this just brings me back to, you know, Gilmore, Ayami. I'm just listening to these records and wanting to make the sound that's on those records. And because you're influenced by more than one thing, you know, not solely influenced by Gilmore and not solely influenced by Tony. I'm also influenced by, you know, what the, the new music is that's coming out and all these things. You know, you you take a stab at doing the this Tony Iommi thing or this David Gilmore thing, and it never is going to come out exactly like them. And then you you start to put your own spin on it, and then you just have to get into a, a more original situation. You have to get into a, a band situation where you are contributing to the writing of the music and making it a collaborative. Uh, endeavor with you and the rhythm section and the singer or if you sing that's it's it's great to learn how to sing while you're learning how to play the guitar and um, and then it just starts to grow because you will start to recognize things that you do and and I'll recognize things that I do and I may decode them and say oh that's like yeah oh, I can see you know I'm letting my let my Randy Rhodes show over here, but, you know, but it all kind of mixes together and that's where you get your own thing. And then people will point it out to you. Oh, I love it when you do this. It's like, oh, do I do that? I don't even know. <laughs> it's interesting that you were talking about, um, you didn't entirely, you weren't entirely focused on learning songs in the beginning that you were, you were reading music. I actually just interviewed another guest earlier this week and they had the same, he went through all the Mel Bay books. And there, there must be something to that. Did, don't, did, did you do it too? All. No, all of, you know somebody else who went through all the Mel Bay books, I Mel do, Bay Modern Method? I, I need to connect you. That's yes. awesome. Okay, yes. Oh my God, so there's <laughs> something to that. And so, so did you go through them and then start working on your, your metal stuff or were you doing it simultaneously? No, it's kind of like the, the teacher left, left it to me to to be proactive about learning the the rock stuff and you know when i when i everybody says this but when i was a kid there was not anywhere near the amount of of uh, resources at your disposal to learn rock stuff you know like they you know a lot of they it would just be like a piano book of the wall and you'd be trying to figure out there's like half the notes in there that you actually need and yeah, like I, I still don't, I, you know, there's a lot of Gilmore stuff that I would have left. I, it would have removed the magic if I had actually learned it note for note. It's only in like the last like, you know, five or 10 years. So I was like, let me just go back and just really, I, you know, I learned the comfortably numb solo. I, you know, the, the. Like I learned that one, and um, but I never really nailed uh, another brick in the wall part two until like a couple of years ago. I was like, I'm gonna get that one. <laughs> I just let it be more osmosis. <laughs> so, how has music shaped your life? How has playing music shaped your life, and how has it informed you outside of music? Oh, that's a good question. Um, So early on, music is is kind of your space, right? You get to make it your space. It's like your safe space, your your time with your music, and and things like that. And and I always found that that was um, you had the solace of that. A lot of us who get really in music um, are, uh, you know, there's. I, I couldn't speak to it. You know, music winds up being a social connector, but when you first get into it, it's very much about your own personal relationship with the music. And some people are more like, 
they discover music simply because they like being with a group of people that love the same song. But I would have kind of, you know, heard about Pink Floyd from a friend's older sister, you know, oh yeah, this is Pink Floyd, check it out. And then the new album came out and then it was just like, uh, you just listen to the whole thing. And, and you know, the, these records that I like are like kind of on the deep side lyrically and things like that. So it, it really created this whole space for me to explore my feelings about things. And then um, as it became something that I knew how to do, it became a lot about how I put myself out into the world. You know, I've had long hair when it was not fashionable to have long hair. Uh, I've had a guitar with me a lot of places that I go most of the time. Um, it would have been kind of how I, how I met people and surrounded myself with people and affects you socially. As you get older, being an, an actual professional musician winds up uh, again, you, you wind up being a little bit of an outsider because it's not 100% like a safe profession, shall we say. And as, as silly as this might sound, it requires you to work nights and weekends. And you'd be surprised just how disruptive like that is to the basic thing of uh, kind of getting married and having children and and things like that it, it winds up being you're you're outside of kind of a standard expectation of of what an adult does with their time <laughs> and so, so 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 there's a lot of things but the main thing about music because i have had jobs i've had regular jobs and you know it helped me during a period if like stuff slowed down musically you could i could i could work and uh, maintain a good credit rating and get an apartment and get a house, you know what I mean? Like I've always, I've always been able to juggle it and um, music is always there for you, I think is the, is the part at the end. Like if you invest the time now early on as a, as a kid in the fundamentals and you get that stuff together, it will always be there for you. Like my daughter's 12, she's had bass lessons ballet lessons, gymnastics, all these things. And I haven't pushed her too hard into any one thing, but she's been, you know, since she was six, like there's been all these things put in front of her and some of them she liked, some of them she didn't like, some of them she liked okay, but she didn't stick with it. But the point there is that now that you're 12, let's start making some choices. Of all these things that you've tried, like let's pick something to kind of put the work in towards so that it's her choice and I think that music is always there for you just like any of these disciplines dance art and if it's just something that gives you freedom outside of what you might call your career path that's just as that's just as awesome if it's what you decide to do with your career there are you know it, it's just it's always there for you and if you put the time in early to get the fundamentals like you'll always be able to call that stuff back up and I think it's great. Wonderful, wonderful. And you, I mean, I was cracking up because I was just thinking about how I have to justify, you know, so much music practice in my own life. So yes, that was fantastic. Now you mentioned the fundamentals quite a few times, which brings me to, I guess, two questions really. Um, number one is uh, what skills should every young musician focus on developing? And I think that's what you're talking about when you talk about the fundamentals. And then the second part of that is, can you talk about your philosophy as a music educator? Maybe there uh, yeah, um, so, well, I mean, the, the fundamentals on guitar, there's, I think there's just having a healthy technique so that you're not, you, you know, um, just watch the angles that you have in your hands. Like you shouldn't have angles that are too much what am I trying to demonstrate this way or too much that way? You know, you have all these tendons running through here. And if you want to maintain your healthy mechanism over the course of your career, you want to sit up straight and you know, alignment and your neck, all, all these things. You know, this, this is stuff that if you get it right early on, you don't have to retrain yourself at another point um, down the road. And it'll keep you in, in, good, in good stead. 
as you move through life. So there's that fundamental technique, hand position, and your body posture and all the all that stuff. Then um, there, as you get into it, there's just hand synchronization, which is, you know, are you fretting the note at the same time you're picking the note? As opposed to, or, <laughs> you don't want that. And you don't want, you want, Everything has to happen at the same time. And so then that's why we're always telling everybody to practice things slowly because you're working on your hand synchronization. You're working on that when you're playing it slowly so that as you speed it up, the hand synchronization, hand synchronization is good and everything sounds clean as it speeds up. So that, that's something that's super important. Uh, and then practice with the metronome so that your rhythm is tight. Uh, that is so important. And I, I still find just my, my sense of time is one of my weaker fundamentals of, of all the things. So I don't want to harp on it for everybody else. You may have fine, but if you spend more time with the metronome, you'll feel more secure and it'll, it really helps you contribute to the group, the stronger your sense of time is because the drummer isn't planning on having to lead you by the nose through every, every measure of the song. The drummer is wanting to count on the guitar player to contribute to the overall sense of rhythmic you know, wellness of the group. So, so then in my, my, my ethic for instruction, is a, I start with, with chops or fundamentals. Uh, there's chops and then there's preparation, which is where you have like your repertoire. So that's the learning of songs. And that's absolutely important. And if they feed each other, so you develop some fundamentals, then you start applying it to uh, preparing some material to perform. And you, in that case, you'll come into things where you're like, this song is hard for me and I don't know why. It's like, oh, because this song has displayed some, miss, some missing element in your chops. So go back to the chops and work it back up so you can perform this song, like that kind of thing. Like I was working on an Ingve thing just for kicks. Cause well, I mean, what else are you gonna do during a pandemic, right? And uh, it was like, you know, I had to do a deep dive on all of his picking strategies. What is this? Right, does he do it that way or does he do it? You know, you have to figure out how Ingve did it in order to really like get that stuff nailed. So chops, then performance and preparation, right? So chops, preparation, and then the, the last thing is like, is essentially, I, I think of it as CPR, kind of like, like cardiopulmonary resuscitation. You have chops, you have preparation, and, and repertoire and relationships, there's all different things in the R category, but essentially you're talking about, if you've got, if you've got the repertoire and the chops and everything all happening, that's when you're out in the world, you're playing music, and talent attracts talent. So that's when all your relationships will start to come to you and that you'll just get more of a community around you and more opportunities to work and play. And that's Amazing. I love that CPR and uh, I see how it was like, CPR. okay, I get it. Okay, so there it is. Chops, performance, repertoire. I find of those three repertoires, it tends to be the things where I'm weakest at. So you're also highlighting some things that I need to work on myself. Um, but yes, I, I love your philosophy and I love how you, how you say that those, those things come together and then you can start to tap into interdependence where you take your talent into the world. You can start to meet other musicians, have that whole collaborative experience, which goes back to what you were saying earlier, how to develop your voice as a musician. So that's a, it reminds me of what Steve Vai talks about, prepare the vessel, you know, so much you're talking about is like preparing the vessel, but when you're ready, you're out in the world, you're, you know, it's, uh, you can hit that other level of it, which is collaboration and interdependence. I absolutely love it. So coming up to the last questions, I want to be super respectful of your time. 
what does music have to offer kids, especially during the pandemic? I know that we're coming out of the pandemic, but still, uh, you know, kids don't have as many uh, activities as, as they did, you know, before the pandemic. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, my, uh, I don't know, I, I just love telling this story, but during the, during the pandemic, um, my daughter came to me one day and said, Dad, can we get an aerial hammock? And I was like, I don't even know what an aerial hammock is. And it's essentially, it's a lot, a lot like what they call a sling, but it's a big piece of fabric that you hang from a high ceiling and then you can do like acrobatics and gymnastics in it, right? So I figured out how to hook this thing up in my garage and she taught herself how to do full-blown like aerial routines just using YouTube. And, um, and then when I, you know, I started, I was like, I need to buy her a mat, you know, like a crash pad because get, it, it was getting pretty intense. I think that like what we've seen folks do during this time is remarkable. I think that kids have faced a lot of challenges and I think a lot of us parents were, uh, were sideswiped by just how complicated it was going to be, uh, particularly with electronics and social media and, and all these kinds of things. But they definitely sold a lot of guitars during this time. I was in the store and like some guy came in and he bought like a guitar starter pack for both of his kids. <laughs> And um, it it it's profound what uh, when when a when a young person takes to it, what they can accomplish uh, with a little bit of direction. And there's and there's so many fo great folks all across the country like yourself who are you know teaching online and doing the best to to bring the materials uh, to younger people, uh, young younger people and older people in order to get them started on a good path. Uh, you know, I, most of my online instruction is done in, as um, pre-recorded videos, and that the facility that does that is down in Florida. So I wasn't able to actually make any content until a couple of months ago. I actually set up a studio with a friend of mine here in in my town in New Jersey, and we that's where we filmed these these two courses that just came out for True Fire. We're kind of calling it the True Fire North Studio because we didn't have to go down to Florida in the middle of a pandemic. But I think that if, if your kid shows any interest in something like this, you know, do what you can to find a way to, to foster it. Um, that, that's the, the best I can say, because they, you know, if they, if you give them the, the, you know, if you can rent one for a week and find out if they actually have the wherewithal to stick with it, um, it's, it's worth finding out. Uh, but you know, kids, kids also need to develop that sense of working towards things. And, and I think a lot of the newer music schools are doing a good job of having that recital performance so that someone gets to feel the, the adulation of applause. And that's, <laughs> it's how they respond to the adulation of applause that really lets you know if they need to do this or not. <laughs> If they, if they get in there and they play Mary Had a Little Lamb and everybody applauds and then their face changes at that moment, like, <laughs> then you know, then you know you're sunk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Two more questions, Angus. Um, how can, do you have any practical tips for parents who want to integrate music into their everyday lives? Um, one thing, uh, one thing that I, I let, you know, I, I'm sure all the parents are letting their kids pick the music in the car, but every now and then I just stand firm and say, we're going to listen to the Beatles. And, uh, and, and my daughter actually responds to that. So if, if that, that's always encouraging. You may not have the same experience, but I, <laughs> I find my daughter enjoying listening to the Beatles being a very cool thing but another thing that we did was um she's a huge fan of ariana grande and they put out the la i don't think the new record is out on vinyl yet or maybe it is but the last record came out on vinyl and we ordered that and it was really cool because um we you know we got 
I have a turntable in the living room and she, you know, she went through the process of taking the LP out of the jacket and putting it on the turntable and how do you turn it on and setting the needle down on it and, and everything. And then we sat and we listened, we listened to the whole record. Um, and, uh, it, it will, it improves the attention span in that way because the activity of listening to an entire album is, you know, that solid, whatever it is, 45 minutes, or this was more like an hour and 15 cause it's a double, it's a double album, but the sides are really short. It's kind of like it's kind of like just over an hour probably of music but it really like you set aside the time to do that because it was on vinyl so i know that that's a maybe an expensive proposition buy a turntable and order your favorite records on vinyl but i had a great time with it if you're a person that owns vinyl if you have a turntable just you know take whatever your kid likes listening to and get, get a copy of it on vinyl so you can it also lets you there they can now relate to why you have this bizarre piece of equipment sitting in the living room <laughs> what is that thing that's for the old people listening to music <laughs> <laughs> and uh, are there any questions i didn't ask you but i should have um i don't know i think in terms of, I mean, I could speak to, you probably cover this kind of stuff all the time, but music does help uh, help people with math. You know, if, if you get exposure to music early on, having to count, uh, having to count the measures, divide up the, the measures into beats, all these things, like there's a lot of resonance with the, the student in terms of how they do in math. It really helps organize the brain in a certain way. And, and uh, I found that to be true for myself and it's also true for, for my kid. And, um, uh, and, that, and then just the joy of singing together is, uh, is a wonderful thing. And I think a lot of people do like the early childhood development music lessons like music together or something where you're singing with your kid and then it just kind of falls off and you shouldn't forget that there's a lot of joy in in just that simple part of it and it, it gives you something to do with your kids and then and there you go who could ask who could ask for more than some way to keep your kids engaged with their parents <laughs> it's like, because they're always losing them to their phones or the TV or something like that. So, yeah, that that's pretty much it. Well, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I've had a blast sitting here talking with you and hearing your perspective on music education. I'm going to ask you to stick around for one more minute, uh, but thank you so very much. I super appreciate it. My pleasure. It was great talking to you.